thank you very much. Thank you, Ante, for uh, this wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I was uh, I wrote something in Croatian, uh, so I would also like to read that uh, before returning to um, to, to English. Um, Prvo sam se želio zahvaliti ne samo Ante u kojem je predstavio, nego i Petru Milatu i Institutu Mama za, za poziv uh, ovde. U Ljubljani je rad toga instituta veoma dobro poznat, pa, je, pa se smatra veliku čast da čovjek uh, znači priča ovde pred uh, tom publikom. Uh, ja sam prvi put u, u toj... Um, uh, ha, u tom obliku u Zagrebu, uh, pa sam... <clears throat> stvarno počašćen, evo, tako. Uh, I naravno, hvala i vam što ste došli na po, uh, slušati predavanje tog čovjeka kojeg uh, uopšte ne poznajete. Uh, dobro, um, to je u stvari sve, samo sam vas želio uh, za ispriku jer ću govoriti na engleskom. Moj hrvatski je uh, u stvari ne postoje. Ja se znam hrvatski samo kroz Alana Forda, kroz Dilana Doga i kroz slične stripove, kroz Smogovce, pa možda taj hrvatski i nije baš ono što, što se očekiva od filozofskog rada. Zamolio bih vas onda da se više ne mučimo i da pokušam um, uh, nastaviti na engleskom. Ok, so here goes. Um, so the topic I chose for today is the question of telos and teleology, uh, the problematic of what, um, uh, of what is known in the history of philosophy as the notion of the final cause. Uh, it is well known that Spinoza stood very clearly against the idea of teleology uh, in nature. Just as, just, as, just as Nietzsche did, and it is equally well known that the concept of teleology as Zweck and Zweckmäßigkeit is one of Hegel's core concepts. So we have, when we say, when we say telos and teleology, we already uh, invite the conflict of Spinoza versus Hegel. But there is another reason I chose this topic, Uh, and that is because it is clear, I think, that the debate about this notion from the history of philosophy is in fact in immediate relationship to contemporary philosophical debates. Hegel's concept of tales together with the equally notorious concept of totality, uh, these concepts were in the final analysis precisely those concepts that French post-war thought rejected and tried to distance itself from. Uh, and this, I think, is perhaps most evident in the philosophy of Louis Althusser, who claimed, uh, who claimed not only that Spinoza's critique of the final cause is the foundational work uh, of Althusser's own theory of ideology, but also at the same time accused Hegel of reintroducing the traditional Christian uh, metaphysics through the back door, so to speak. So Hegel's concept of teleology for Althusser is basically nothing but a variation of the theological concept of the end judgment of the parousia. So Althusser is a very clear example of the French thought who rejects Hegel precisely because of uh, uh, the concept of teleology and affirms Spinoza's stance, which is basically that nature knows no, uh, knows no telos, knows no um, purpose. Gilles Deleuze, who was even more inspired perhaps by Spinoza and Spinoza's philosophy uh, and what he called the philosophy of affirmation or what could be called the philosophy of pure affirmation. He shared, Deleuze shared Althusser's critique of Hegel and even claimed uh, more or less that in contemporary philosophy everything depends on rejecting Hegel. And Pierre Maché, whose, uh, whose book on uh, Hegel uh, or Spinoza, uh, Ante already mentioned, he was uh, Althusser's student and collaborator uh, with the infamous uh, collection Reading, uh, Reading Capital, Lire le Capital, Cita, Cita ti Capital, uh, I think is the Croatian um, translation. Uh, well, he analyzed very, in, in great detail Hegel's reading of Spinoza. 
Uh, and he, you know, he, he even ventures into saying that his title, Hegel or Spinoza, uh, is supposed to mean, uh, is, is, not, is not supposed to be uh, the exclusive or, like Hegel versus Spinoza. He says that it's, uh, it's supposed to be read like the Latin sive, like Deus sive natura, which means, uh, uh, which means God or nature, but also implies God that is nature. So sive means that is. Um, as well as being uh, uh, an exclusion. However, Machere ends his book, uh, the, the bottom line of Machere's book on Hegel or Spinoza is basically a very clear choice for Spinoza, who supposedly, and I quote, read in advance Hegel's dialectics and refuted it. So, so, Hegel, uh, so Machere's book actually, Hegel or Spinoza pretty much describes the situation where we have to choose either Spinoza or Hegel. Adrian Johnston, who is not, uh, who is not unknown in this, in this institute, uh, wrote in his recent book on adventures in transcendental materialism, I quote, I would go so far as to maintain that one of the primary antagonisms splitting materialism today, today from within is that between neo-Spinozist and neo-Hegelian tendencies. The former, namely the neo-Spinozist tendencies incarnated by Louis Althusser, Gilles Deleuze and their various progeny, seeking to dissolve the figure of the subject, and the latter, the neo-Hegelian tendencies of contemporary materialism, represented most notably by Zizek and Slovene Lacanianism, uh, seeks to preserve the concept of the subject. End of quote from uh, Adrian Johnston. So, I'm just trying to imprint the idea that the, you know, the, the, the discussion of Hegel uh, and Spinoza, or Hegel versus Spinoza, is somehow defining of the contemporary, uh, contemporary philosophy. A split between Hegel and Spinoza is perhaps repeated today as a split between Lacan and Deleuze. In a way, Aaron Schuster, who will be presenting his book on pleasure next week, or uh, like on the 11th, uh, I think, um, makes this argument as well. Namely, that the split between Deleuze and Lacan is representative of more than just the lineages of those two thinkers, and that uh, the vitalistic affirmationism of Deleuze must by necessity be thought together with the death drive of Lacan. One somehow belongs to the other. So the idea is that it is somehow productive to read Deleuze and Lacan together, just as it is productive to read Hegel and uh, Spinoza together. So this is a kind of an introduction uh, to, to my actual topic, which, was, which is supposed to be Hegel's specific concept of telos, which I hope will persuade you that it is not that horrible at all, as it may sound. Uh, 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 as it may sound. So how does Hegel's concept of teleology, Zweckmäßigkeit, relate to the Lacanian concept of subject on the one hand, and death drive, on the other hand, these two concepts which I have kind of uh, underlined as, 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 the, as the nodal points where, where materialism, contemporary materialism clashes. So I guess I, do, I, I don't believe I will be able to answer this fully today, but my wager is that there is in fact a way to understand Lacanian subject on the background of Hegel's concept of telos. And at the same time that we can in fact understand death drive with a reference to Hegel's concept of teleology. But this may sound like a bizarre promise, but I hope I will be able to deliver, at least on some level, uh, on it. So, now the, the paper proper, which is full of quotations from, for, from Hegel, which I apologize uh, to you in advance, but I have, uh, I have made the attempt of, um, uh, yeah, of, uh, <coughs> putting those quotations here for people to read. I, I guess, I hope you can read it. If you, if you hate English, then go for German. That's, I, I try to put both languages. All right. So let us take a look at two of Hegel's most famous formulation from his Phenomenology of Spirit, which I think already uh, give us enough reason to understand why Althusser and Deleuze and a lot of the French rejection uh, from Hegel focused specifically on the concept of, of telos and teleology. So I quote, the true is the process of its own becoming, the circle that presupposes its end as its goal, Zweck. 
having its end also as its beginning. And only by being worked out to its end is it actual. So this is, this is of course, one of the most famous quotes from Phenomenology of Spirit. Uh, the idea of the true as a kind of a circle, which is set in motion by its end, understood as its purpose, and retroactively moved to its beginning, this is precisely what the final cause was criticized for, basically. Uh, it, it sounds like the typical mix-up, the typical metaphysical mix-up of the cause and effect. I mean, this is, this is what Nietzsche argues. This is what metaphysics does. It mixes up cause and effect. This is uh, Nietzsche's critique of the concept of uh, the final causes. Let's take a look at the other quote, which is a bit longer, which is, again, another extremely famous quote from Phenomenology of Spirit. What has just been said can also be expressed by saying that reason is purposive activity. The exaltation of a supposed nature over a misconceived thinking, and especially the rejection of external teleology, has brought the form of purpose in general into discredit. Still, in the sense in which Aristotle too defines nature as purposive activity, purpose is what is immediate and at rest. The unmoved, the unmoved is what uh, Hegel says, the unmoved which is also self-moving and as such is subject. Its power to move taken abstractly is being for itself or pure negativity. The result is the same as the beginning only because the beginning is the purpose. In other words, the actual is the same as its notion only because the immediate as purpose contains the self of pure actuality within itself. The realized purpose or the existent actuality is movement and unfolded becoming. Entfaltet es werden. I do apologize for this extremely long uh, uh, citation, which is at the same time also kind of hard to understand because, you know, because it's Hegel, basically. Um, but I think it does include all the necessary uh, all the necessary points that we need to address when we talk about Telos uh, or Zweck um, uh, in, in Hegel. By the way, may I ask you something? How do you translate in Croatian? Kako se hrvatski kaže causa finalis? Smotreni. Svršni. Svrha. Svršni. Okay. Okay. Na slovenskom je smot smotrni uzrok. Okay, but never mind. Svršni, okay. Svršni, which is good. Svršni, because uh, svršni, it implies the end. Uh, a smotr, the Slovenian word, does not imply the end. I like the svršni much better. Because uh, svršni implies uh, svršetak, it implies ending, which is perfect. <coughs> which is what the, 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 the Greek word telos implies as well. Telos means end. Um, all right. So, what we have here in Hegel is, is basically, I mean, Hegel even uses Aristotelian words like unmoved mover. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't say it that, uh, that clearly, uh, like he doesn't use the phrase unmoved mover, but it is clear that what he's describing is a kind of an unmoved mover. This uh, paradigmatic Aristotelian metaphysical concept, right? The unmoved mover. Uh, we have it here somewhere, this... Uh, I'll try to highlight it if that's possible. No, it's not possible. Anyway, the unmoved, uh, which is also self-moving. This is the precise quote. So such beginning, the unmoved, which is self-moving, is called by, by Hegel telos, or purpose of the whole movement, because it stands at the beginning of the movement, or is the beginning of the movement, while at the same time it can only be realized as the outcome of the movement. So, w what I'm trying to, to picture here is all these formulations that Hegel actually uses, which confirm the suspicions that he's a typical metaphysical thinker of uh, tele teleology. But I think the formulation that seems to confirm all the suspicions of Althusser and other critics is the formulation at the end of the segment, the unfolded becoming, entfaltet es werden. Why, I think so? Because in German, as well as in English, the term implies an organic development, like unfolding of, of leaves or, 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 or blossoms in spring. I'm guessing this is, this is what you can say in English. You can definitely say that in German. So entfalten means like, like, like leaves 
you know, leaves start to blossom or start to develop or whatever. And faltet es verde. So Hegel's uh, explicit reference to Aristotle and the purposiveness in nature seems to confirm this. Hegel's concept of purpose does not only imply circularity, but also a motion similar to organic blossoming. Whenever one thinks of Hegel's purpose, Hegel's concept of purpose, telos, one apparently also thinks of the organic metaphors. And among those organic metaphors, which Art Althusser really hated, among those organic metaphors, Hegel's favorite metaphor is that of the germ, kind, kal uslovesti. Uh, as the, so, so the germ as the plant in itself. That's, that's his formulation, which is very well known. So this is a quote from Hegel's Encyclopedia of Logic. I'm just going to go and read it. In the same sense, the germ may be called the plant in itself. It's a mistake to suppose that the thing in itself of things is something inaccessible to our cognition. All things are originally in themselves, but that is not the end of the matter, as the germ being the plant in itself means self-development, so the thing in general passes beyond its in itself, the abstract reflection on self, to manifest itself further as a reflection on other things. It is in this sense that it has properties. So this is, this is precisely what, what, what Althusser's critique of Hegel was aimed at, that he's presenting us a, uh, a very simple idea of how history uh, uh, unfolds, basically. That we have a, a germ of, uh, of an idea that in history only needs to unfold, basically. Like, like leaves unfold uh, from, from the germ. That's, that's the idea. And, uh, and you know very well how Althusser's critique of Hegel tried to argue that uh, historical uh, situation is much more complex than those simple either logical or organic developments. Um, so here I think we have a, a very good example. Uh, I think what I've tried to do is to list all these uh, uh, examples in Hegel which uh, pretty much confirmed all the suspicions. Uh, and if there was ever any doubt that the concept of telos, zweck, is the very nodal point where all the notorious Hegelian ideas converge, namely the metaphor of the circle, the development of the concept as a simple expression, and all of those flourishing organic metaphors, then the following quote from Encyclopedia's Philosophy of Nature could be used as the final piece of evidence against Hegel. Uh, this is unfortunately my translation. I couldn't, for some reason, I couldn't find the English translation on online. I'll, I'll try to read the German because I think my English translation is just bad. So here goes a little bit in German. Der Zweckbegriff aus den natürlichen Dingen innerlich ist die einfache Bestimmtheit derselben. Zum Beispiel der Keim einer Pflanze, der der realen Möglichkeit nach alles enthält, was am Baum herauskommen soll. Also als zweckmäßige Tätigkeit nur auf die Selbsterhaltung gerichtet, gerichtet ist. Sorry for this mix-up of so many languages, but I really couldn't find the, uh, for some reason I couldn't find the English uh, translation to this. So it seems that we have everything thrown together in a bucket, so to speak, here in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this passage. The concept of telos in the realm of nature is nothing but a simple determination of the natural thing. The germ of the plant is the perfect example in nature for Hegel's idea of how concept is developed in the spirit. So this is the metaphor of, of the germ. Uh, just as the germ develops into a tree, so do the concepts uh, develop from something simple into something more complex. And yet, of course, as I intend and must demonstrate, things are far more complicated than this for Hegel. There are two indicators of this implied in the very quotes I presented. Firstly, Hegel is himself very critical of what he calls the external teleology, and secondly, there seems to be some difference in Hegel between using the metaphor of the germ as a metaphor of the conceptual development and the actual discussion, uh, Hegel's actual discussion of tele teleology as a, as a process within the realm of nature. So he, he discusses teleology in nature and at the same time, uh, or separately from this actually, uses uh, this process in nature as a metaphor. So these are two distinct things that Hegel does. I will try to expand on both of these two counts. So first, let us take a closer look at the idea of external teleology. Uh, now, it may surprise 
those of you who hate Hegel, but Hegel's critique of external teleology is just as sharp as Spinoza's. So here, actually, Spinoza and, uh, uh, and Hegel absolutely share the point. Uh, in the next uh, quotation, which is from, uh, from, lectures, from Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy, he comments uh, on Francis Bacon. He comments Francis Bacon, and you'll see that what, uh, what Hegel ridicules is exactly what Spinoza ridicules in, in his ethics. So I'm quoting, Considering things in terms of final causes includes, for example, explaining the thick coat of animals as serving the purpose of warding off heat and cold or hair on the head of, for the sake of warmth, or lightning is God's punishment, or leaves on the tree for the purpose of preventing harm to the fruit and sap. Treatment in terms of final causes refers principally to outer purposiveness, or what I call external te uh, teleology, outer purposiveness, as Kant's apt distinction has shown us, whereas inner purposiveness constitutes the foundation of the organic. It is an end in itself. So, so actually this is Kant's distinction between external teleology and internal teleology. And it's basically a very simple distinction. Hegel's critique of external teleology is almost, uh, well, yeah, it's, it's basically the same in Spinoza and it's basically from Kant. The mistake is uh, in that we pick a random effect, such as, for instance, a military defeat in combat uh, or a natural disaster, and explain it as a purposive result of an unrelated action, such as, for instance, the law which allows for gays to serve in the military. I don't know why I chose this particular example, but I remember, I'm pointing to Americans, I remember <laughs> <laughs> I've seen on television these idiots who would come to a, 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 a military per person being uh, put in their grave and they would shout, God hates fags. Why? <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's very uh, hard to explain, but I think the idea is the person was not gay. Uh, like the, the military person who died was not gay at all. But I think their point is somehow that God is punishing American military because they allow gays to serve. In, I mean, it's completely ridiculous, but it's, uh, it happens, apparently. Anyway, uh, Hegel doesn't even bother to give an example. Hegel just uh, evokes this idea of uh, lightning as God's punishment. He doesn't even, uh, you know, he doesn't even care about this stupid idea enough to give an example. I gave one. Anyway, this is really the, the, paradig uh, the paradigmatic example of this uh, sophistic uh, procedure. But Hegel's critique of final causes goes well beyond this dismissal of the elementary form of sophistry. This is very important. Hegel goes much farther than just dismissing this, uh, this simple, uh, naive sophistry. In Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel writes specifically on human goals, intentions, absichten. Uh, and actions. And he says, I'm not sure if I included, no, I haven't included this quote. So I'm quoting Hegel from Phenomenology of Spirit. The actual crime, however, has its inversion and it's in itself as possibility in the intention as such, but not in a good intention. For the truth of intention is only the act itself. The truth of intention is only the act itself. This is from Phenomenology of Spirit. The truth of intention is only the act itself. Now, Hegel's context is very different from that of Louis Althusser and his thesis of the material existence of ideology, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. But it seems that they completely shared the idea that the truth of an intention is only in the act itself. I'm total, well, at least I am, but I hope you as well. Uh, uh, the, uh, I'm reminded by this Hegel's uh, inadmission to any question about good or bad intentions. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Althusser's use of, of Pascal in his famous, uh, in his famous uh, text on ideology. Uh, namely, Pascal advises to those who do not believe, are you familiar with this uh, text and this specific bit? Uh, I'm looking at you, but for no specific reason other than you are close to me. No, you're not. No, you're not? All right. So I'll just <laughs> I'll just briefly go and explain it. So Pascal, uh, Pascal tries 
Pascal, the, the famous mathematician, blah, blah, uh, uh, but also a Christian thinker, tries to advise people who do not believe in God and ask him, well, but how do we start believing in God? You know, just like that. And he says, well, in order to start believing in God, you have to actually go to church, kneel down and pray, move your lips in prayer. And that's it. So the whole realm of belief, the whole religion, will inevitably result as, uh, as a consequence of the material action that you take. Uh, and Althusser uses this as uh, a paradigmatic example of what he calls the material existence of ideology. He says that ideology is not something that floats in our heads um, and then determines how we act, but is rather the other way around, that ideology is our actions, uh, you know, which take us to the church every Sunday or not. Uh, so this is this is this is the the, the example, and uh, Althusser even goes uh, and wonders about, hey, but what about bad subjects, or what about those who go to church but think uh, about some something very sinful, or <laughs> I don't know what, and um, and Pascal as well as Althusser say that that somehow does not matter. They, their intentions, their thoughts are somehow irrelevant to the fact that they are uh, practicing the material rituals of that religion. This is, this is their point. And it seems like Hegel's uh, refusal of, of, of what human intentions, uh, uh, of whether human uh, intentions are possibly in conflict, conflict with their actions, is actually very much in line with Althusser's uh, concept of ideology. So all of this is like a like a big uh, uh, like a big uh, break, no, like a comma or whatever, like a, an excursus, uh, uh, in order to say that Hegel goes much further th further than just um, dismissing the external teleology. He even goes into uh, explaining, you know, that basically. Uh, that basically the truth of an intention is only in the act itself. <clears throat> All right. Um, oh, I'm missing a page. That's not nice. Ah, I found the page. I'm back, back on track. Um, Now, let us take a closer look at what Hegel calls the internal teleology, and it's, again, just something that he picks up from Kant. Hegel takes up, uh, uh, he takes this up from Kant, but he, uh, but he uses it basically to denote the Aristotle's idea of, uh, uh, of entelechy in biology. Um, and as I already mentioned, in this context, telos is the designation of the essence of the natural being itself. This is how uh, Hegel straightforwardly says it. So for Hegel, Hegel uh, Althusser's concept of internal teleology and teleheia was basically an argument that the natural realm can be explained consistently with mechanical determinism. This is. Uh, uh, this can be deduced, I, I'm shortening my argument here, but this is basically what his arg uh, he, he's, he's talking about biology actually in his uh, Wissenschaft der Logik, in his science of logic. And it's, uh, it, it somehow serves to his purpose to show that there's, uh, that there's uh, something what he calls uh, mechanism, there's something what he calls uh, chemism, and then there's something he, uh, that he calls teleology and refers to, to, bi to the realm of bio biological. And he says that uh, where, where uh, well, basically, teleology is precisely um, the point where, mm, where the physical or chemical realm break in a way. Uh, it is only uh, with the introduction of the realm of teleology that we can start talking about the freedom of the subject. This is, I mean, this is this is why he is even talking about teleology. Still, he, he, he is talking about teleology in this biological Aristotelian sense. But we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this uh, later on. So any, anyway, just to, just to give the uh, very clear uh, idea of what an inner teleology is, uh, is, is this, to explain the growth of a plant by relating to the germ as its inner telos, 
is perfectly legitimate, right? If you uh, plant a seed and then something grows up from that, then you could absolutely say that the, the tree was somehow already in, in the seed, right? The, and it, it, it's kind of its inner telos. It's kind of its inner purpose. But to explain the extinction of an individual, uh, like death, by referring to a stroke of lightning as a consequence of actions of that individual is to commit the fallacy of the external teleology. Right? So this is the simple, the simple distinction. And only once the difference between internal and external teleology is established, we can get deeper into the problematic. So here things become much more interesting. And it becomes very clear, uh, it becomes clear very soon that the problem resides in the fact that Hegel often makes us think that the process of the concept could easily be explained as a development of some internal telos. It would seem that dialectics is nothing but internal, uh, but a development of uh, internal teleology. The process of reason must only express or ren render manifest what was already present in its germ. It is therefore quite essential to point out a couple of moments in Hegel where it becomes obvious, painfully obvious, that the organic metaphor used to explain the process of the concept is only productive to a certain point. So I'm going to try to list a couple of examples where Hegel himself clearly uh, limits uh, the usefulness of the, uh, of the organic metaphor, of the metaphor of, uh, uh, of the germ as plant in itself. Um, so in his lectures on the history of philosophy, he explains the difference by, uh, 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 between the internal teleology of nature and teleology of the concept by claiming that the fruit of the plant does seek a return to the germ, but it produces another germ, different from the first. And Hegel says that this is very different from what happens in spirit. So this is a... <coughs> It's another quotation. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Ah, yes, this is it. So, so here goes. As with the German nature, spirit indeed resol uh, resolves itself back uh, into unity after constituting itself another, but what is in itself becomes for spirit and thus arrives at being for itself. The fruit and seed newly contained within it, on the other hand, do not become for the original germ, but for us alone. In the case of spirit, both factors not only are implicitly the same in character, but there is a being for, for the other, and at the same time a being for self. That for which the other is, uh, is the same as that other, and thus alone spirit is at home with itself in its other. The development of spirit lies in the fact that it is going forth and separation constitutes its coming to itself. So this is again uh, a very complicated Hegelian uh, uh, sentence. I think it's, well, it's more than one sentence, but it's still very complicated. But it basic, if I try to unpack it, it basically comes down to this. The difference is that in nature we have the germ and then the tree and then an apple, let's say, and then, an, uh, you know, and the seed. Uh, and then another germ. So we have basically two different germs, uh, two different uh, uh, two different objects. We can we, we can distinguish two different objects even in nature. Whereas in spirit, what gets uh, outside of itself and is transformed and comes back to itself is is one and the same thing. That's the that's the big difference between nature and spirit, according to Hegel. And he, he, uh, he uses this argument many times. I, I've used one example, but he uses this argument many times. And actually, one may object here that Hegel is, uh, Hegel's argument here actually brings us to an even greater difficulty. Because uh, in biology, the fact that the germ uh, at the origin is not at all the same as the germ as a result guarantees that change is possible, right? Evolution is only possible because there is a factor of uh, chance, coincidence, uh, contingency, which allows for uh, genetic mutations, right? I mean, this is how evolution happens because the first seed is not the same as the result seed, right? I mean, this is how evolution happens. Um, and Hegel's spirit, however, seems to be, just as Deleuze argued, an instance of sameness. 
an instance where all the process of negation, uh, of becoming other and so on, is nothing but a very long way to affirm the original sameness. So this would be, uh, this would be the core of uh, Deleuzean argument. Basically that by saying that the spirit remains the same somehow, the same matter, the same substance, uh, Hegel is actually you know, proving Deleuze's point. It's an argument for sameness. However, for Hegel, the point is that the spirit does uh, go, uh, does undergo uh, development, and that the spirit, as the outcome of the process, is not the same as the spirit that was at the beginning. The point is rather that not only did the transformation occur, but that it occurred to the spirit itself. So that the spirit, uh, 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 the spirit managed something like a self-transformation. This is like the magical thing that spirit can do and a seed cannot do. The spirit can do a self-transformation. Uh, this is where Hegel is profoundly anti-Aristotelian. The substance itself is transformed by the accident. And I'm evoking some terminology which uh, to people here might be very well known because a lot of people here love work of Catherine Malabou. And I'm not using these terms of substance and accidents and so on, uh, you know, just just because they're there, I'm using them because I know that um, her specific reading of, of Hegel uh, might be very useful here. Anyway, this is also precisely what Hegel resents in Spinoza. This is why he insists on the formula that substance itself is not enough, that it must be thought as substance and subject. Like the subject, the subjectivity of the substance is precisely its, uh, its capability of self-transformation. This is something that, that Hegel did not see in Spinoza's <coughs> substance. Uh, but we can detect this on the level of the metaphor of the germ itself. While the organic unfolding, uh, and Falten, the Aristotelian inner teleology, is indeed used by Hegel quite often as a metaphor of the self-development of the spirit, there is another phrase that is at least as prominent in Hegel's writing, a phrase that should warn us immediately that there is something other than organicism at work here. That phrase is the germ of death. Der uh, Keim des Todes. This is something that Hegel really loves. It's a, it's a bit of a creepy metaphor that he uses, the germ of death. Um, but he does use it, he does use it um, quite extensively, actually. In, uh, in Phenomenology of Spirit, you, you, there is no metaphor of uh, the germ as plant in itself, but there is the metaphor of uh, the, the germ of death. <laughs> so let's take a look at how, how this, um, oh wait, no, this is too good. Ah, oh, no, okay, we'll have to wait for this a little bit. Uh, anyway, in Encyclopedia, for instance, Hegel's, Hegel writes, let me find a quotation. But the fact is, mutability lies in the notion of existence and change is only the manifestation of what it implicitly is. The living, this is important, the living die simply because as living they bear in themselves the germ of death. So this is the germ of death. This is the, uh, he, he also uses the germ of doom sometimes, but, but I really like the germ of death. Somehow I, 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 I find it really um, fascinating term. Anyway, it sounds gruesome enough, but what exactly does this mean for Hegel? To be more specific, what exactly does death signify here. Because again, we all know that death is also an organic process of decay, <clears throat> of destruction, degradation, decomposition. And in the passage I just quoted, it may even seem that Hegel is referring precisely to this organic process of decay, to death as a part of life itself. Like, again, the living die because as living, they bear in themselves the germ of death. Like, it, it, does death mean this organic decay? Is death in this, the, the sense that Hegel is trying to, to use is, is that death as part of organic life? Well, anyone who's ever read anything from Hegel will know that this is simply not the case. Death for Hegel is, is, uh, is, is simply not uh, reducible to an organic process. Um, this would be the concept of death in Spinoza, simply the de decomposition or destruction of individual specific disposition. Spinoza w would argue, and in fact did argue, that such destruction of an individual always comes from outside of the individual. It can never be understood as an internal drive of that individual itself. 
But in truth, I think that Hegel and Spinoza aren't even in contradiction at this specific point because for Hegel, the death of natural thing has a completely different meaning. Let us take one more time at the encyclopedia. Uh, another, uh, another look at the encyclopedia. As you know, it is divided in three parts, the logic, the philosophy of uh, nature, and then philosophy of spirit. And I want to uh, invite you to a specific point in this entire encyclopedia, which is the ending, the end chapter of um, uh, philosophy of um, nature, uh, which is a kind of a transition to philosophy of uh, spirit. So we're going to take a look at a, ch uh, at a specific chapter which is supposed to bring about a transition from nature to spirit. And the title of the ch chapter is The Death of the Individual Out of the Individual Itself. Der Tod des Individuum aus sich selbst. I Okay, you're not nearly as scared as I am <laughs> about this title, but I thought it was really scary. Maybe I should say it in German one more time. Der Tod des Individuums aus sich selbst. It, it should be scary, I think. So, anyway, it, it's precisely the question of death, clearly, that separates nature from spirit. And what facilitates the transition from nature to spirit. And surprising or not, we will come back to the question of purpose precisely in this chapter. The purpose of nature is to kill itself. <laughs> Don't you just, you have to love Hegel. The purpose of nature is to kill itself and break through its shell of the immediate, of the sensible. To consume itself like a phoenix in order to upsurge rejuvenated the spirit. So, the Ziel der Natur is sich selbst zu töten. I like it. Uh, now, of course, what, what strikes us immediately is the term Hegel uses is not Zweck, Telos, uh, but Ziel. Ziel in Croatian, I guess, just as in Slovenian. If we do speak about Telos in this instance, it should be very clear that this is not a question of the biological or inner teleology. The death of nature by itself uh, and through itself is not anything like an organic decomposition. Rather, it is compared to the burning of Phoenix. So what we have here is a completely different metaphor. In order to explain uh, the death of, of nature, um, it is simply not enough to use any organic metaphor. The metaphor that Hegel uses is that of Phoenix, uh, of the bird which dies in its own uh, which burns itself and then rejuvenates, it stands out from the fire, uh, renewed, rejuvenated. So we have a completely new metaphor here, one of phoenix and death. Telos here does not imply an organic unfolding, but rather a rejuvenation through death. And if you follow Hegel's explanation of the death of the individual through itself, we, we quickly come to the same resolution. Hegel is not talking about organic death at all. Rather, what he means by death, by death that the individual is born with, by death that is his original sickness, his ursprüngliche Krankheit, is the fact that an individual is a limited being in the first place, and that it is therefore not fit for universality, unangemessen, uh, unfit for universality. In order to overcome this condition of unfitness, of being unfit, of, of being unangemessen, the, the individual can only attain an abstract universality through habit, Gewohnheit. And it is precisely the habit that is called the death of the individual through itself. The habit is the deathly circulation of life without any transformation. The repetitive, ossified life uh, itself. Uh, Hegel uses the term verknochert, uh, or kosteneo. Uh, ossified life itself. It is through habit that individual becomes like a bone. It is through habit that nature kills itself and becomes spirit. So, to try to, uh, to sum up all these points uh, and produce a kind of conclusion, I'll just uh, recap. And I'll say, first of all, that Hegel's critique of external te teleology, just to repeat this, uh, is just as sharp as Spinoza's. And the external teleology, uh, 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 um, if you remember, is the idea you know, that there's a kind of an invisible hand 
that guides uh, individuals so in order that uh, in the end, you know, on, on, on the market, everything is fair and just. That, that kind of idea is basically the external teleology. And it's criticized by both Spinoza and Hegel. Second point, uh, Hegel criticized his own metaphor, uh, his own organic metaphor. Uh, his own metaphor of uh, uh, the process in spirit or the conceptual process as something similar to the organic process of plant growing from a seed. Um, this metaphor of the internal teleology breaks when we consider that spirit is self-transformation. And finally, we arrive to the specific Hegelian concept of telos and teleology, which includes two completely new metaphors, which are the germ of death and the metaphor of phoenix. And these are clearly completely different concepts of, uh, uh, of telos, of end. Uh, it's clearly also that it has something to do with death in both instances. And this may be related and should be related, of course, to, to specific uh, Hegelian understanding of uh, Christianity and what happens in uh, the death of God. But we don't need to go there uh, right now. Um, and yeah, well, just to, to conclude this presentation, hopefully this is enough to lay a groundwork for something that, of course, must be a much uh, uh, much wider uh, inquiry into how exactly do we connect this to Lacanian concepts of the subject uh, and how, do, how can we connect this to the Lacanian concept of the death drive. Well, it may seem that I have made a good argument like, okay, you have mentioned the term death a couple of times, so presumably you will be able to, to uh, to argue that this death, first of all, is not organic death, and this is precisely what is going on also in, in, in Freud's, or at least in Lacan's version of, uh, of Freud's uh, uh, totest trip, right? It's, it's not about organic death. It's not about, uh, you know, eros and thanatos. Uh, it's about something else. Uh, the question of subject may be a bit more uh, harder not uh, to crack. And I will not be able, of course, to, to develop this argument fully. Uh, but what I think could be done is to point out one instance where, where Hegel basically employs uh, tacitly the, the concept of telos and where we can see the instance of the Lacanian subject at work at the same time. I'll try to explain this, and this will be my final thing. Uh, Slavoj Žižek makes this uh, famous reference, uh, which I think everyone knows, to Hegel's concept of monarch. Uh, in uh, Hegel's philosophy of right, there's the, this instance of the monarch, uh, whose, whose sole function in the state is to accept what others have, like the laws uh, that others have prepared for him, all he has to do is basically to dot the I and say, I will it, I will it. So that's, that's, that's the entire job for Hegel, uh, for the monarch. So Hegel actually argue, makes a huge argument for, he, he's in favor of, 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 uh, of hereditary monarchy, which is something that, you know, if you haven't uh, delved into, it needs to be discussed why, why he does that. But Jirik's point is really just uh, uh, limited to this question. The, the instance of the monarch, which is nothing but his formal, uh, I will, uh, I will it so. Uh, and he says that this is precisely the instance of the Lacanian uh, subject, like this, uh, this vanishing subject, the, the subject that uh, is is, has no content in a way, but is only the formal instance of I will. And what, I guess what I would argue for is that with Hegel's own uh, terminology, we could easily say that uh, the instance of the monarch is the instance of telos, in, in the sense that, you know, the, the, the stamping of, of the bill is, is a kind of an instance of telos, is, is a kind of, uh, uh, of, of packaging the whole thing together. We, we, it's a kind of a formal gesture which bears absolutely no, um, 
no content in itself, but is simply uh, you know is simply there to make the thing whole. That's the that that would be you know that's really a a, a very uh, brief sketch of where the argument could take us. So that's it. That's what I have prepared for today. Thanks. Thank you.